to understand that. Not their truth, but thought put into pictures. They want to see truth. And so our evangelists, the unknown authors of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they presented the truth so that it could be seen and not forgotten. Unfortunately, men have mistaken the presentation, the personification for the truth. And it is not, as the world is day, belief. Here we are, in the next two weeks, the churches will be filled to overflowing for those who have not seen the inside of a church in the last year. And they have their preconceived notion concerning what Jesus is. And those who will lead them in this story, they are just as far removed from the truth as one can be removed from it. They haven't the slightest concept of who Jesus really is. I do not hesitate to tell you because I have experienced it. I am not speculating. I am not theorizing. Now we take the truth. It's a pattern. A pattern that is buried in man. It's the pattern of God's awakening in man. That is Jesus. It's a pattern. When the pattern begins to erupt and to unfold in man, then you are departing from this age. Scripture emphasizes the fulfillment of Scripture in the life of Jesus. Now, do not think of Jesus as a man. Think of Jesus as a pattern. A pattern that was predetermined before that the world was. A pattern that is buried in man. Which pattern then unfolds in man at that moment of departure from this age to return to his original source, to his original state which is God himself. That is Jesus. When the pattern begins to unfold, you are at the very end. So it's called the Passover. And when the Passover came, he knew that his hour for the departure from this world had arrived. Now, he turns to those, it's not a man, any more than I am or you are. And he said, O oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have said concerning the Christ. So slow of heart to believe it. All that the prophets had foretold concerning this story. And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then said he, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So the only emphasis in Scripture is the fulfillment of Scripture in the one called Jesus Christ. When that pattern begins to erupt, one understands Scripture. Until it erupts within man, he doesn't understand the closed book. It's a closed book. His name is called the Word of God. And the word of God comes into the world in man, if you got in man, to interpret and give new meaning and new value to the whole of life. 
But when it erupts, then the whole book that was sealed, the written word, takes on new meaning. And he tells the world. Now we are told, after he departs from the world, Peter stood up and said to the brothers, and he numbered them. He said there were approximately a hundred and fifty. That's all. He paid five thousand. He paid four thousand. And wherever he went, there were enormous crowds to hear his word. But when he departed, those who believed him only numbered about a hundred and fifty. And the world would say, well now, that is the end of it all. Rub it out. But he was the word of God. And the word of God cannot return unto God void, but must accomplish that which he purposed, and prosper in the thing for which he sent it. So after 2,000 years, there are billions who know the story externally. They thought they could rub it out completely, but they could not rub it out. Today, more Bibles are sold concerning this story than all the bestsellers put together. You find on the Sunday issue the ten bestsellers of fiction, the ten bestsellers of the non-fiction. Put them all together and their sales, their weekly sales or yearly sales, would fade into insignificance compared to the sale of this book. Translated into over 1,200 languages and dialects. So the 120, because it was sent by God. Well, I tell you, he has sent it again. This time to take off the covering of kindergarten. And to show you who Christ really is. That he is a pattern. There is no description of him in scripture concerning a person. It's simply a plan, a plan of salvation. And I am here to tell you because I have been sent. Sent to do the same thing on a different level. To take off the outer garment of kindergarten. And let a man begin to explain and mature, to see within himself a pattern. And put his faith completely in a pattern, not in a person. And set his hope completely on the unfolding of this pattern within him. For the whole story is all about the pattern. And the pattern is buried in man. That is the story. So slow of heart, said he, to believe all that the prophet said. Should not the Christ suffer these things and then come into his glory? If you read the story carefully, you'll see the hiddenness of Messiah all through scripture. He's not external, it's hidden. For here they turned to him and said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? whose father and mother we know? How is it that he now says, I came down from heaven? And then they turned to him and said, Who are you? Where is your father? And he said, You know neither my father nor me. If you knew me, you would know my father also. For I and my father are one. And my father is he whom you call God. So you do not know me. If you knew me, you would know my father. I came out from my father. And I came into the world. I am leaving the world and returning to my father. I am not of human origin. So you know my father, Joseph. And you know my mother, my brothers, my sisters. But you do not know me. I am not of human origin. That's what he's telling me. I was not born of blood, nor of the will of man, nor the will of the flesh, but of God. And I came into this world and I suffered. I had to. That was my promise, my commitment. 
So the word translated child, translated slave, translated servant in scripture. And we'll find it in the third and the fourth chapters of the book of Acts. Literally means son. It is pace, P-A-I-S. And you'll find it in your concordance. The actual definition is a son beaten with impunity. That's the son. I am the son. You are the son. And the father puts us through the paces, beaten with impunity, that he may make us himself, for his purpose is to give us himself. Theologians speak of God as holy thou. In this century we have what is considered one of the greatest of all theologians, Karl Barth. And in his work he said God was always be spoken of as holy thou. Not H-O-L-Y, W-H-O-L-L-Y. Holy thou. That's a lie. I tell you that the God of whom the scripture speaks is not holy thou, but a father whose purpose is to give himself to his son. But the son has to go through hell to conform to the image of the father, that he may actually reflect and become the express image of God the Father. In the end, when the drama is over, that son goes through a predetermined series of events within himself, which is the end of the drama, and the suffering comes to an end. And then he awakes, and who is he? He is God the Father. It was worth all the pain so Paul could say, I do not consider the sufferings of this present time worth considering with the glory that is to be revealed in us. What is that glory? All right, you're told it's the glory of the Father. Father, return unto me that glory that was mine, the glory that I had with thee before that the world was. I have accomplished the work which thou gavest me to do. And are we not told at the end of Job, after the horrors through which Job was put, and then all of his friends and his relatives came to comfort Job? Why? For all the evil which the Lord had brought upon him. It's your loving Father that puts you, the Son, through the faces for the purpose of giving himself to you. There is no other way to do it. So should not the, the Christ suffer these things and then enter into his glory? So people will say to you, well, don't you believe in Jesus, a man? Well, aren't you a man? It takes a man to be the agent of that pattern. Every error has a man as its agent. And every truth as a man, as its agent also. So if he said, I am the truth, it takes a man to be the agent to externalize and to experience that truth. So Jesus is not a little man born 2,000 years ago. Jesus is the eternal pattern of redemption, where God actually redeems his Son by giving himself to his son. It's a pattern. So forget something on the outside of you. That pattern is buried in you. But when I tell it, it's like last Friday night. There was a lady present, and she knows she's been coming here for quite a while. And I said something from the platform, and she identified herself with what I said and thought I was talking about her. I wasn't talking about her at all. 
At the end of the meeting, she said, you know, tonight I didn't understand one word that you said. It was completely beyond me. I didn't hear one word you said. Because in the beginning, I spoke of a mother and her daughter and the daughter's stepfather, which undoubtedly would have to be the mother's second, third, or sixth husband. Once it is another than the father of the child, it would be a stepfather. Well, it so happens that they were present, and I say it from this platform, they are with us tonight. I think I said that. Well, her daughter was not here, but she didn't hear that. She was sitting next to her step, her husband, who happens to be her second husband. Therefore, he is the stepfather of her daughter. And all she could now think, I am talking about her, I'm talking about her daughter and her present husband. And I wasn't at all. <clears throat> I was speaking of a trio, a stepfather, a mother and a daughter, and they were here. And it was a delightful, wonderful, mystical experience that the daughter had. For a dream is egocentric. I was in the dream, so was her mother, and so was her stepfather. And so were others not recognized. But it was all an egocentric experience based upon the daughter, where she was overcoming the mother image where she had a violent, horrible fight with the mother over a simple little thing of combing and setting her hair. And she won out by saying, you can't stop me. This is my right, this is my life, and you can stop me. And the scene changed. And she found herself floating over the water, watching ships go by. And then she found herself standing on the ship. And then she looked up, and here on the same ship is her stepfather and her mother. And then I am walking on the water, coming towards the ship. And I greeted the three of them, and then as I turned away, I turned back, still walking on the water, and addressed the stepfather and the mother. And I said, last night she heard her music. She heard from the depths of her music. Well, it was the most glorious victory for the pupil, for she recognized me as her teacher in the dream. I was the one who overheard the violent argument, the horrible, horrible conflict between my student and her mother, and the victory of my student, where she got over and cast off the mother image. And here is my friend, sitting here, identifying herself with the story, and it's not her story at all, it was not her daughter's story, and didn't hear one word I said. So you see, you can sit here, and if I say now, Jesus is a pattern, only a pattern, and you don't believe that, suddenly you will hear one word I'm going to say from now until I close the meeting. That's the difficult part of getting over to anyone in this world. A fixed idea blocks everything from coming through. You start on politics. And if you're a dying-the-world Republican, and someone uses the simple little word, Democrat, you don't hear any words. And if you're the opposite, and someone uses the word Republican, you don't hear a word. It's no such thing as gray. It's all black and white. As far as politics is concerned, and the same thing is true of religion. And she told me quite honestly, after the meeting, she said, I didn't understand one word you said tonight. Everything was completely confused. And then I turned, I said, you see that trio over there? That's the trio that I spoke of tonight. I wasn't talking about you, and here was her husband next to her, about your husband, or your absent daughter who is not here tonight. And I thought I said, the three are here tonight. But you didn't hear that. You only heard mother, stepfather, and daughter, and that fits your pattern. For you are a mother, you have a daughter, and you are married again, therefore there's a stepfather. 
That's how you travel in this world and people don't really hear. So I am telling you who Jesus really is. Jesus is the pattern of redemption. That pattern is buried in every child born of woman. That child born of woman is the Son of God. That Son of God is beaten with impunity by God the Father for a divine purpose. He is put through all the paces of the world that he will come to an end that was predetermined. That end is a pattern. And when he comes to the end of the journey, that pattern erupts suddenly without warning within him. And when it erupts within him, all the sealed book of the Old Testament becomes visible to him. He is only now fulfilling scripture. For the only scripture known in that day was the Old Testament. And I have come to fulfill scripture. And when scripture is fulfilled in man, that pattern gives meaning, new meaning, new value to the whole of life. And he can say now, the time for my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth has laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Let no one now bother me, for I now bear on my body the marks of Jesus. <coughs> so he is now Jesus. So Jesus is simply the pattern. And the man in whom that pattern unfolds, he is the Lord Christ Jesus. So they can say to him, are you not the son of Joseph? Do we not know your father and mother? Then tell me, who is your father? How do you now say that you came down from heaven? And then he answers, why before Abraham was, I am. I am not of human origin. After this thing unfolds, he knows he is not the garment that he wears. Before Abraham was, I am. And if Abraham is the beginning of the entire unfolding of humanity, if I say before Abraham was, I am. Then I am not of human origin. Not born of blood, or the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. And God actually became me and put me his son through hell that he may give himself to me. And when he awakes within me, I am he. And this is the story of Jesus. The story that will be told but not really told in the next two weeks. They'll tell you all kinds of things about this man who came down and sacrificed himself for humanity. A little man, born supernaturally, had no physical father but a physical mother. No, this garment was woven in my mother's womb, and that's real. But there's something in me that is buried. And when it awakes and erupts within me and unfolds, then and only then I know who I am. And I was all along, I was the son of God, but I didn't know it. But I was the son of God who could be beaten with impunity. Now you read it carefully in scripture. Why the translator takes the word pace. And once he translates the word slave, next time servant, next time child. And occasionally son. The word basically means son but the son that is beaten with impunity. And occasionally they'll say the son, and then use the word Jesus in the word. Often, more often, David. Thy son is translated, thy servant David, who by the mouth of thy servant David did say, then they quote the second psalm, which is the psalm, Thou art my son, 
today I have begotten thee. So I tell you who Jesus really is. He's the pattern. It's the pattern man buried in every child born a woman. And when you've gone through the furnaces and you come to the end and not before that, then suddenly the pattern unfolds within you and you understand scripture. The whole Old Testament becomes alive and contemporary and it's not of the past at all, it's all now. And it's all about you. So you could truly say in the volume of the book, it is all about me. And then you tell it. Well, I've been sent to tell it, for well, the time has come. And should I go tonight, well, take no difference really to anyone, because I've told it. And if there's a small audience, read the 15th and 16th verses of the first chapter of the book of Acts. And when he departed this world, and was gone, he appeared first to Peter, then the twelve, and then to over five thousand, or other five hundred. Most of them are still with us today, he said, but some are fallen asleep. That is a euphemism for die. Many died, but not all. Then he appeared to James and then to the apostles and then last as to one born untimely he appeared unto me also this is Paul speaking but in spite of that and in spite of thousands that he fed and the hundreds who followed him only about a hundred and twenty remained faithful to the message it was something they could not accept that's how difficult it is to overcome fixed ideas in this world. Nothing in this world is more difficult than a fixed idea. But I've been sent to tell you. And if it seems a few, it would make no difference. A thousand years from now, two thousand years from now, it will cover the earth. They will know, they will rise from kindergarten, for the time has come to give up milk and start eating the meat of spirituality. Now the churches are trying to overcome the collective concept of life into an individualistic concept. Well, the chances are that they're following through. But I was sent. Think to tell it just as it will happen in me, what well, it has happened in me. Now, he goes on to say, this scripture had to be fulfilled. This is Peter speaking. It had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who led those who arrested Jesus. It had to be fulfilled as spoken by David. He goes back into the Psalms and he's quoting the Psalms. That this thing had to be fulfilled. Well, what did Judas betray then? If he had to fulfill scripture. He betrayed the messianic secret. That's what he betrayed. He told the secret. Well, I've experienced that in a room not unlike this. Not modern, no. It was an ancient setting. But an almost queer thing like this room. When I am seated on the floor and talking to men who sat on the floor opposite me. And I'm teaching them the word of God. And suddenly one of the twelve rose and made a quick exit. And I knew instantly what he was going to do. He was going to tell what I have just said. He is going to tell the secret that I actually gave them. He's going to betray the secret. And instantly, this man came in, tall, handsome, wonderful, well-clothed man, and walked in a military stance, and walked up, turned to the right at right angles, came to the end, turned to the right at right angles, and then at the center, he came on down, 
and then stood in front of me. As he stood in front of me, he took a mallet from one of his attendants, and he hammered into my shoulder a wooden peg. I felt every blow, but it wasn't painful. And then he took a sharp instrument, like a knife, and made one circular motion and severed my sleeve, and then pulled it off and cast it away. And my arm was bare from the top of my shoulder to the tips of my finger. And then he stretched his hand out like a cross. And then he embraced me, kissed me on the right side of my neck. And I kissed him on the left side, the right side of his neck. And then, as it began to fade, I looked at the sea that was discarded. The most beautiful baby blue of lovely, lovely texture. And that came to an end. Now, here is your story in Isaiah. And who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It's all symbolism. Here is the one now who will actually tell the story. For the arm is the power of God. And Christ is described as the power of God. And the wisdom of God. So the time has come to actually move forward from kindergarten into a higher level of understanding of the mystery. And that's my story. And if only a dozen believe it to the point of living by it, that's enough. It will cover the earth in time. And they'll all know it's not a man. But it is a pattern that is buried in man that is called and personified in Scripture as a man. Because truth embodied in a tale shall enter in at lowly doors. Take the story and you tell it in the form of a tale, like secular history, and then people can see it. So they want to see truth. So the evangelists, because they want to see truth, they took this supernatural setup and close it in the form of secular history. And the leaders of the churches, not knowing it is not secular history, they perpetuated it over the centuries. But I am telling you, it is not secular history. It's the eternal pattern of salvation. That's how man is redeemed. But he actually came down, he is the son of God, you're the son of God. <coughs> but a son <coughs> who is going to receive fatherhood. God the Father is going to give himself to you. And he couldn't do it until he first transformed you into the exact image of himself. Because you can't reflect other than the Father. You're going to radiate and reflect the Father because you will be the Father. And only in the very end can you really have this pattern unfold within you. You are the Job. The word Job means, where is my Father? That's what the word means, where is my Father? And the whole search of the world is for the Father. So where is it? I'm telling you where it is. I'll tell you how you're going to find them. Because no one comes unto the Father except by me, the pattern man. Not by me called Neville, but by me, the pattern. There's only one pattern. There aren't two. And that pattern is in you. And I'm going to tell you how it's going to erupt. And the first grand eruption is when you begin to wake within your own skull. No one is present, just you. And then you come out of that skull, and that's when you are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of the man, but of God. And God is the wind, the spirit, and you hear it. The born of the wind, born of the spirit, born of God. And then, to confirm it a few months later, he brings humanity clothed as one being, and that one being is David.
For David is the symbol of humanity. You've gone through all that man could ever do. You've suffered everything man could ever play. But mercy was on you and kept the memory from it. So you did not remember the horrors through which you've gone. But you went through the furnaces. I have tried you in the furnaces of affliction. For my own sake I do it. For my own sake. For how should my glory be given unto another? I can't give my name to another. I can only give it to myself. So I have to make you myself by putting you through the furnaces. That's the story. And when you come out, it doesn't matter what you went through. The glory that is now yours. The glory of being God the Father. That's the story. Now you can tell it as hearsay until you can tell it from experience. The day will come you'll be able to tell it as a witness and not as one who heard it from another. Today I can tell it as a witness for I have experienced it. When this garment is taken off, whenever it comes, I am one with the source who is God the Father. So, Jesus Christ is the pattern of redemption. The pattern buried in all children. Which pattern will remain there even though they go through the gate called death it does not stop anything. They are restored to life in a world just like this. And they continue the journey. Being beaten with impunity, may I tell you, until the end. And when the end comes, suddenly, all is forgiven. All is justified. Divine acquittal. He is my son who did my will. And then the whole that you ever experience in the world is gathered together into a single being personified before you. And he is God's son, David, and he calls you father. And then you know who you are, you're God the father. And that's how it's done. So let them talk this coming Sunday on the Passover. And let them tell all the stories this coming Good Friday, a week from Friday, and the following Sunday, oh, they'll have thousands over for Easter service, and all will be talking of a being that never existed. And all will be singing all their praises to some myth that is not it at all. But at least it kept the story alive. For the ancients knew that people could not actually see a bare truth. They could see better if the truth was clothed in the form of a picture. And so they took it and clothed it in the form of a picture. And then they kept the story alive. But the time has come for man to graduate from kindergarten. And what I'm telling you tonight will be repeated and repeated through the centuries. And then as many as today attain kindergarten, and there are over a billion on earth today, will be attending high school. Now that is going to the silence.
food. No, are there any questions, please? This is the time for it. If I didn't make it clear, this is the time to ask the question. Because he sent me, and his word, and he is called the word of God. He only sends the word, and I am the word that he sent. He embraced me, incorporated me into his body, which is infinite love, and then sent me. And therefore I cannot return unto him, boy. I must return unto him, having completed the action that he sent me to perform. And so having performed it, he has his own way now of spreading it. Just as a small little company of 120 has overrun the earth, 1,200 translations including dialects, outnumbering all the bestsellers put together year after year after year. And no one who is a betting man would have given anything for the future of that movement. No one. It just couldn't be. But today we have one billion people who call themselves Christians. They've heard the story and they believe it. But they believe it as children believe a story. It's kindergarten. The time has come now for promotion into another level of consciousness where we take off that personification and reveal the pattern and I've revealed the pattern to the best of my ability I have told it in my book resurrection how it happened these four mighty acts that must take place in man and when they take place all new values, all the new things take place within him, and he fully understands what formerly was a sealed and closed book. He is fulfilled scripture, he is the word. The scripture is the written word, and he is the living word that interprets scripture and gives new meaning and new values to it. And so I cannot, because having sent me, he is doing it. All along the way, he prepared it. And this was the time for it to be done. See, scholarship is not enough to understand scripture. He gives it to the lowliest of men, as told us in the book of Daniel. He takes one that is unknown, one that is not at all considered qualified, and he gives it to him. Well, when he gives it, he goes with me. I am not alone. If you saw me, said he, you would see my father also, for he never left me. But you do not see me, for had you seen me, you see my father. That's what he tells him. If you only knew me, you would know my father also. And if you don't know my father, it's a confession on your part, you don't know me. For man is looking at the garment that he wears. As Blake said, oh my Satan, you truly are a dunce and canst not tell the garment from the man. So the being behind the mask, if that pattern has unfolded within him, he walks completely unknown in the world, but he knows who he is. And he tells the story. Very few people will accept it because, as I told earlier, this lady, a very sweet, wonderful lady, with great understanding, and yet in the early part of the lecture, she was blocked. And I spoke for one solid hour, and she didn't hear me. She was blocked in the beginning because I started the story in the beginning.
to tell a story of one who was present, but it was not her daughter. And she identified herself with the story as the mother of the one who had written me the letter. And she was not the mother of the one who wrote me the letter. That's how man blocks himself. Just a little idea, he's blocked. You know that. You go into politics and you know exactly, you're told in a barbershop, don't discuss religion, don't discuss politics, and just don't. Anything else here, ask about your family. How is your daughter doing? I'll go to the barber tomorrow, the first thing I'm going to say, if I get the same barber, because I don't make an appointment, I go and take anyone that is free. And one has a daughter at UCLA. Well, I will say, well, Frank, how is she doing? And he would love that. And I really mean it. I like the man, and the mere fact he has...